Good morning. My name is John Butler, and I'm representing the Minnesota Digital Library. I'm joined by my colleagues, Carla Urban and Greta Bonneman in the audience, and I'm sure several people on the stream back home. So we're uh, very pleased to uh, participate here. Actually, we are thrilled. We are very grateful to our funders, and we're filled with a sense of challenge, too. Uh, in order to um, fulfill the promises of being one of the initial service hubs of the DPLA effort. It's, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. The Minnesota Digital Library, which I'll just uh, note as MDL from uh, this point forward, is a program in the state of Minnesota by Minitex, which is our 40-year-old uh, state and regional resource sharing network based at the University of Minnesota. So we're building on a strong organizational uh, foundation there. We are, in recent years, just supported, just gaining support from the state of Minnesota's 25-year-old, or 25-year promise um, of a clean water, land, and legacy amendment funding, which the citizens of Minnesota, in their infinite wisdom, at the abyss of the recession in 2008, voted a sales tax increase to fund cultural heritage for the long term. So that's um, quite extraordinary. We're also supported by a lot of in-kind uh, efforts by the University of Minnesota, uh, Minnesota Historical Society, uh, St. Cloud State University, and so forth, uh, and some additional funding from these parent institutions. So uh, we are known by a, through a couple of interfaces, I would say, both uh, web interfaces and service interfaces. Uh, we do have uh, our aggregation of content and search engine here, which pulls together uh, many, many collections called Minnesota Reflections. Uh, we have chosen to invest in the creation of lots of uh, educational assets to integrate the work uh, and the materials in the Minnesota Digital Library into educational programming in the state uh, with close binds to K-12 uh, educational standards. So here's an example of one such learning uh, module, uh, a foot in two worlds, talking about uh, Indian boarding schools in the early part of the century. And we also have sort of an internal professional interface to the library and museum community, uh, as well as K-12 teachers, that promulgates uh, best practices and standards in di digitization, uh, metadata creation, and also teacher training uh, with respect to use of the tools that we provide. So here's a little bit of the tail of the tape on MDL. We're about 150 institutions strong by means of contributions, and, and you can see uh, we cover all types there. Um, this is the figure that I like to talk about when describing MDL. You can also see the other figure down there about our sort of our asset size, and, and we're relatively small, but the real story, uh, I think, of our existence over the past eight to 10 years has been the contributor and content recruitment done by a very strong outreach effort throughout the state of Minnesota. We have an, uh, a staff member, uh, Marion Rangel, who has a full-time job of, of traveling the state, building relationships with small, medium-sized, and even large content providers, and bringing them into the fold, empowering those institutions to, to do things they probably have never even imagined or certainly did not have the wherewithal to consider doing. So this is a, a very strong part of our story. And again, we have uh, uh, an expanding range of information types and topical uh, areas covered in Minnesota Reflections. Just to give you a, a, a a little bit of a glimpse of the coverage we have. Uh, these are our county areas, uh, state, regional, historical societies, which we have uh, very strong participation, and our library, museums, and other organizations. So we run the range here from the, uh, the Blue Earth County Historical Society to the Hazelden Foundation, Minnesota Department of Transportation, Minnesota Department of Health, the North Star Museum of Boy Scouting and Girl Scouting, the Minnesota Streetcar Museum, and so forth. So just even by the, the litany of uh, participants, you can kind of get the feeling for the, the range of uh, uh, cultural depiction that we represent. Our program areas are 
digitization, and we do this uh, as a, a gratis service to the contributors here in exchange for their participation in metadata creation. We provide the online access, and we've done a lot of experiments with that uh, in terms of um, brokering out our metadata to other search engines, uh, experimenting with new tools to broaden that access. Mentioned before, the very strong K-12 uh, and learning support integration that we value considerably in the state. And we're, we're, we're beginning to think about expanding our infrastructure, and this won't primarily be a part of the DPLA effort, towards a statewide digital preservation effort. Uh, a lot of assets have been created, millions of dollars of digital content has been created, and there hasn't really been the wherewithal among these institutions to pull together the infrastructure and the, uh, and the expertise needed to provide good stewardship for it over time. And we think this is an ideal thing to move forward in a concentrated, centralized fashion. So we're beginning to, to plan our steps there. And as I mentioned before, we're very active in professional development and education. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a sampler, like Mary did as well. This will be a, a bit rapid fire, but just to give you a taste of some of the materials that we presently have in our database and repository, which will be making its way into the, the larger stew of uh, DPLA. Uh, and, and this presentation part here will kind of give you a sense of not only the topical range, but also the format. Uh, format diversity that we covered. So we go way back, Fort Minnesota, which is really uh, mid 19th century and, and forward, to um, depictions of small time life where this stereograph of the first locomotive to arrive in this town in central Minnesota, 1880. Another small town depiction here. The coloration there is because this is a magic lantern slide the precursors to Kodak transparency slides, uh, and this was quite something when, when these hit the market. Uh, Barnum and Bailey, 4th of uh, July parade in 1911, small town Minnesota. I think was mentioned before as one of our themes moving forward uh, with exhibits would be the CCC. We have lots of these panoramic depictions because there was that many uh, in the workforce and of course with the tools to allow that uh, zooming and panning so people have identified uh, their relatives over time. We have a marvelous collection of uh, cyanotypes documenting the topography, the geography, the small town river life of the upper Mississippi River Valley um, in the uh, late 19th century and this is a critical record, I think, uh, depicting the, the region uh, as well as also, as you can see here, it's been um, produced by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers as a way to do planning for the river construction, the locks and dams and so forth. Uh, it's just a marvelous, marvelous collection. And turning to the arts, uh, a wonderfully rich collection of theater programs uh, again, going back to the early part of the 20th century. And part of our history in Minnesota is our um, not quite annual creation of ice palaces, but we, d we do this. They're, they're getting more expensive, but this is the first ice palace in the U.S., uh, circa 1886. And yeah, so how do you make an ice palace? Well, you actually go out in the lake and you, you have harvesting machines and you cut cubes of ice and you transport them to a flat land. And, uh, and then when lights come along, you can illuminate them and they're really quite marvelous. Uh, I think we're going to have one again this year, so I hear. Uh, we've reached out to the religious community and monastic community in Minnesota as well, uh, and lots of uh, wonderful artwork that has not seen the, has not been shared publicly, certainly not in the way that the web allows us to. And again, this, uh, the viewing tools allow us to really take a look, get into the, the, the fibers of this watercolor, uh, if you will. 
Now, we do have some very special collections here, uh, including the, um, uh, a, a rare uh, collection of letters and one poem from the famed American Midwest novelist Sinclair Lewis, uh, where he discusses his career, his writing, his social life, and these letters are directed to an intimate friend, uh, and so it's, it's quite special. We have begun to expand our collection of Minnesota newspapers, uh, ranging from a, a very wide time span, and this is an example of one that documents the very strong labor history, particularly in the 1930s uh, in Minnesota. You'll see some others coming up. We've worked with uh, a number of uh, state and city offices as well to capture their records, uh, including public health departments, uh, uh, various city departments that were concerned about the urban health. Uh, so it paints a picture of poverty in Minnesota at various pictures, uh, at points in time. Uh, so these are uh, very moving with their photographic evidence as well as the, um, the actual public health data that uh, is presented in the documents themselves. So this is an embedded image from a report. And finally, I want to talk about the area in which we'll be moving into for our online exhibit, and that is the uh, uh, looking at native cultures. So here we have um, one of many, many items in our collections that is published in the Dakota language. This one is, uh, is a marvelous little pamphlet on the caring of horses. It was translated by a Dakota poet and faculty member at the University of Minnesota. Uh, this pamphlet was created to teach students, and I'm going to talk about the, who these students are in a minute, at the Santee School about the care of horses. Uh, this school, uh, was instruct, instructed Dakota children in the Dakota language. So the, the, the hard part of this story is that um, this school served children who came from families who were removed to Minnesota from Nebraska after the U.S.-Dakota conflict in um, 1862, 1863, 150 years ago. Uh, in, in the aftermath of this war, the school was founded, <clears throat> and it was so in 1870, as an academy, excuse me, <clears throat> to train native teachers. The school uh, developed a printing press in 1871 and pr produced many, many marvelous materials in the Dakota language. And so some of this has been translated. It's providing us with an opportunity to collaborate with the, with the tribal cultures uh, to do further translation. So this is part of where these collections can take you in terms of uh, relationship building with the various cultural communities in an area. And as part of that expansion of our newspapers, uh, here we have uh, two native culture papers, one going way back, uh, 1871, and one here from the 1990s. So again, this is an um, important part of the uh, cultural record, but also an in important bridge to build with uh, the community, uh, in communities in Minnesota. I wanted to mention uh, an additional major project that, sort of a sister project that's done at the University of Minnesota that was funded also by this Cultural Heritage Legacy uh, Fund that has resulted in the development of a, a major Ojibwe talking language filled with media objects and uh, audio files of uh, dialect of words moving from both Ojibwe to English and English to Ojibwe. Uh, you can check that out on the web. It's quite a stun stunning uh, and useful resource with great prospects for um, helping to preserve the uh, Ojibwe language. So, to me, MDL and DPLA is about amplifying the effect in all directions. It will allow us to do more of what we've done. It will allow us to do some of the things that we've struggled to do. It will allow us to not only bring more content on board, but use that as a springboard to sharing it more broadly with the world and commingling these resources 
with the collections of the other service hubs, the content hubs, and who knows, the, the, the vast expanse of contributors in DPLA's future. It is sort of, for us, the proverbial um, uh, tip of the iceberg here. So that's us on the top and, and the DPLA potentials on the bottom. Although I was thinking maybe icebergs are not a great metaphor in the <laughs> age of, of uh, climate change, but let's go with it. So. Specifically, this is what we intend to do um, at this point in our early planning with the, our, our DPLA generous funding. And, and that is to do some of the things that you heard about uh, earlier from both Emily and uh, Mary, and, uh, as well as our colleagues in Utah. Minnesota Digital Library is, is a fairly small fragment of the digital content known to exist in the state of Minnesota and in the region. We want to build an aggregation to serve, to feed into uh, of those other collections. Many of them are major, major collections that don't need to play in the MDL space, uh, but are willing to share their metadata. Uh, we would like to harvest that metadata, aggregate it locally as a hub, and feed it into DPLA as a much more comprehensive representation of uh, Minnesota uh, culture and its um, rich digital hair, uh, legacy. Major digitization, uh, we are beginning to develop some ideas around forging new relationships with major, other major museums in Minnesota that we have not dealt with before, and some of the, the recruitment for that participation is underway. It could be a very exciting uh, uh, potential for us now, here's a new one for us. Um, taking a page out of uh, Mary's work here, the community source uh, digital documentation. We have uh, a number of very interesting communities, immigrant communities in particular in Minnesota. We have one of the largest Somali populations in Minnesota. We've had one of the largest Hmong populations in the Twin Cities. We haven't done so much work in terms of documenting that culture. We would like to engage the community in documenting their culture with contributions to the MDL and to the DPLA. That is our idea moving forward here, and to use the, the generous funding to do so. We talked a little bit about the online exhibits. Uh, our focus will be on the native cultures, and I hopefully have given you a little taste of what uh, is to come there, but also to draw upon the content of the other service hubs in creating this exhibit. And like the others, we're very excited about the prospects of engaging the community directly with um, uh, a number of events that showcases not only the, the work of DPLA, the work of MDL, but the work that they can bring to bear in terms of uh, con contributing assets, uh, doing some of the crowdsourcing work that Mary talked about. We have those in mind as well. So thank you very, very much. Thank you to our funders. It's just, um, we're extremely excited and uh, very, very grateful. We have any questions from the audience? We may have time for one or two. One or two? I was just curious um, because you spoke about the differences between doing it yourself versus outsourcing. So could you speak a little to the cost and the work that you had to do to do it in-house versus what it would have cost you to outsource it? I know speed was a factor as well. Right. Um, okay. yeah. It really depends on the kind of content. What we have found is that uh, when we cost it out, paginated materials, we could do it just as fast ourselves and cheaper. So we continue to do that in-house. There's also the kind of, um, kind of tension between shipping archival materials somewhere out of Kentucky, and there is a, some pushback to that. We don't want to do that. But say with our newspaper dig digitization, we can send some of those files to a vendor and get them back cheaper than we can do all these processes ourselves. We, can, we're, we have the ability to do it but it's just cheaper for us to, and we, we tested that model. We actually measured the time it took, 
each step and how much we were paying people, how, you know, and it, it really is cheaper to do part of that, but then retain that, the metadata, the content, pieces of it ourselves so that we have a really good product, or we want our quality to be super high, and that mix works for us. You know, it really depends on your situation, if you have the staff, if you have the ability to train up people to do this, you know, you're, you're better off, I think, in many ways to outsource it. Martin Gomez will be our last one. This is a, a question for Emily. I'm thinking about uh, the business structure or business model that you're thinking about in your relationship with the hubs, uh, the service hubs and the content hubs. Maybe too early to talk about, uh, but are there some concepts evolving? So, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a little early for the content hubs, but um, the idea is that obviously the content hubs have a great deal of content. Um, these large repositories and these other um, folks are, are really reaching out to many of these smaller repositories. So really pulling that together, um, you know, is certainly the goal, having these big pockets of content um, be able to, to work together with the smaller pockets of content. And obviously we see this as simply a pilot as this is the starting point because we know that these big repositories and these small repositories have to work together. So this is our really our business model test case, if you will, um, with these, you know, with both of these size um, and varieties of content. Um, obviously you saw how many varieties of content formats we have already. So um, I really see this as our, our kind of our business model test case to see how this works. Um, and then, you know, really being able to, able to scale up um, and, and learning. We, we've talked already just among the service hubs about all that we can learn from each other, um, just the differences and the similarities that we have and um, things like white papers that we can produce as part of this process so that, um, you know, we can further this model and, and move things forward. So we spent yesterday talking a lot about um, how other people um, can join their there's so many people already reaching out and who have that enthusiasm to be a part of the DPLA and um, who aren't necessarily part of either the initial service or content hubs. And we want to think about this model as well as other models for joining um, via aggregators, other kinds of aggregators or, or what have you. Um, so I think this is, this is our starting point um, and one, one business case, but I think there'll be obviously others to come. Thank you so much, Emily and Mary and John. You've given us a taste of what the it of the DPLA will be, and I think you can get a sense of the excitement of what we can put together if we work together at a national level uh, in exactly this way. And, and Martine, I think your question about business models is a good one. Um, I would say that's also still in the wet clay department. So if you are a potential service hub or a potential content hub, I think you should let Emily or any of us on the team know that you are interested in that. And if you are a funder uh, watching either uh, virtually or here in the room and you would like to support something, I think you can see the model that we're pursuing for the DPLA, which is of course we need some uh, funding to have a very, very lean organization as we have, but we really are seeking to push funding out into uh, small and rural libraries to uh, local historical societies, to state level organizations, and hopefully in partnership what we can do is just leverage up all of these efforts on behalf of the country and as uh, Chairman Leach said, uh, in the service of uh, foreign affairs as well. Um, so I think it's a very exciting moment here for the DPLA. Um, before we take our break, which will be between now and 12, I wanted to do one uh, final thank you for this round, which is um, you've, uh, you've seen the wonderful work of Emily and John and Mary and their teams, which are, I think literally is the tip of the iceberg for many of the service hubs, but also um, what they have come up with is the direct result of the content and scope work stream and many others um, collaborating with them. And uh, Rachel Frick, where are you, Rachel? Rachel has been the leader of this in many, many ways, particularly as the uh, co-chair and really the, the primary chair of the content scope work, uh, work stream. Um, so I want to uh, end this session with a really big thank you to uh, Rachel in particular and to all who have helped to frame out exactly the strategy um, that we're seeing play out today. Uh, and we'll see you back here at 12. So please join me in thanking uh, the great team.